I would like to call the Longmont Housing Authority Board of Commissioners meeting May 21st, 2024 to order. Can we have a roll call, please? Um, Chair Peck. Commissioner Yarbrough. Commissioner Hidalgo Ferry. Commissioner McCoy. Commissioner Rodriguez. Interim <coughs> Executive Director Harold Dominguez. Housing Director Molly O'Donnell. County Supervisor Kendra Sarah Ernie, Public Safety. Eric Martin, Executive Assistant. Tim Hall, Assistant City Chair. Commissioner Chris. Do we have any agenda revisions to this packet? Okay. Um, we need, I would like a motion to review and approve the April 16, 2024 minutes. I move uh, the April, 20, uh, April 16, 2024 minutes as presented. Second. To move by Councillor, no Commissioner <laughs> McCoy, seconded by Commissioner uh, Hidalgo Ferry. Are there any? Is there any discussion about the minutes? Seeing none, let's vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. So the minutes pass. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Martin is absent. So we are on to public advice being heard. Is there any public? I don't see any, so we will move on to old and new business. Resolution, who wants to take over uh, the old business, old and new? Yeah, we'll take that. So, okay. uh, commissioners, you have item A, resolution LHA 2024-07, to approval the First Amendment to the Intergovernmental Agreement with the City of Longmont to accept additional CBGCB funds for the LHA accessibility project. This has been presented to you a number of times and this is just continuing to finish out work. We have to do this with all the very compliance equipment. Right. Can I have a motion to move LHA 2024-07? So moved. Second. So moved by uh, Commissioner Yarbrough, seconded by Commissioner McCoy. Uh, is there any discussion on LHA 2024-07? Seeing none, do we need to open this up to the public? I don't this? think we have to. Okay. So um, let's vote. All those in favor of passing 2027, say aye. 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 All those opposed? That passes uh, six to one with, Council, with Commissioner Martin absent. Resolution LHA 2024-08 is approval of the intergovernmental agreement with the City of Longmont to accept ARPA fund interest funds for an accident at overcrossing. Um, so commissioners, um, we talked to you all a few times about this. This was um, the funding that we were able to utilize from the interest earnings on the ARPA dollars that we received from the federal government to put, um, I forget the number, but it's 525,000 into the early child care facility associated with the Sent on Hover. I think that was a big piece of them leveraging the other grant funds that uh, Molly was talking about, the $2 million from the Colorado Health Foundation, which fully funds the early child care facility at the Sent on Hover. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to move 202408? I move resolution LHA 202408. Second. Uh, moved by. Commissioner Hidalgo Ferry, seconded by Commissioner Yarbrough. Uh, let's vote on those. Um, Wait, I do have. Oh, Pam, discussion? I do have a point of discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, because, as we recall from the uh, City Council meeting, so that I fine. was concerned that we were originally budgeted 200000 for small business. And we discussed how uh, it was difficult to uh, meet the HUD requirements to meet small, small business. Um, but I'm wondering if some of the ARPA could be funnel to small business um, in the amount of the 200000 because it is not, its interest is not um, committed in the same way that the HUD money is. And my argument for that is that oh, when we're talking about small businesses, they everything that they do basically pays into the platform of core services. And we're talking sales tax, property tax, and use tax. We have some small businesses that are still having trouble getting going with um, COVID-related issues. And we do have two facilities or you know institutions that could help with that, the Latino Chamber of Commerce and the, the regular Chamber of Commerce, and they could find places for that money to go. Now, I know that early childhood 
child care education is one of our pillars. But we really need to fund our core if we're going to be able to do those special projects. And one of the things about sales tax, property tax, and use tax is it all goes into the general fund, which we're anticipating might be a bit tight this in the next budgeting cycle. So, is it possible to split some of this money and send it to small businesses? Not in your capacity today, uh, because you're accepting the funding from uh, the city uh, via council direction. So that would be a council decision if they wanted to split that funding. But um, council's already directed it to go there. Well, I brought it up at council, and so I'm just still beating that drum. <laughs> and I think we'll hear it when we, when we come up to budget discussions, why we will need more in our general fund. So. Okay. Right. Uh, is there any more discussion on, on this uh, resolution? Seeing none. It was already moved by Commissioner Hidalgo Ferry, yes. seconded by Commissioner Yarbrough. Let's mm -hmm. vote on this uh, resolution. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And I'm going to dissent. All those opposed. Mm -hmm. So I'm this passes five to two with. Uh, no, five to one. No, five to two. Marshall's not here, she hasn't. Marshall's just. Not uh, thank you. Five to one with Councilor Chris, Commissioner Chris in opposition and Marsha Martin, Commissioner Martin absent. So we are now at Aspen Meadow Senior for exploring issue update. So I will take this one. Uh, since we last, uh, the last LHA board meeting, this board of commissioners directed staff to move forward with trying to solve the Aspen Meadow scoring issue uh, and, you know, with a couple of tasks that we could go down. Uh, we were successful in getting the um, general contractor and the architect to mm -hmm. we good with this, Jim? Mm -hmm. okay, to sign tolling agreements, which um, would pause the statute of limitations, which means I, we have signals that all groups want to, to work together on this, which is good. I met out at, on site last week with the general contractor and the flooring materials supplier and walked and came up with some ideas for solutions and we all ended up um, with at least a direction that, that all of us could agree to um, moving forward. And so what we're waiting for now is for them to come back with a schedule and a pricing estimate and a proposal for how they plan to cover that. Mm -hmm. And so once we have that in hand, we'll, we'll share that with the, with the board. But we just have pieces moving. That's, okay. It's a basic update for now, but it is certainly a high priority and moving along. Thanks for all your work on this. And I know it's been a pain, um, many pains throughout the LHA. But You're movement. painful for the people living there. So. Yeah. 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 We just want to get it fixed. Do you have a date? Did they give you a date as to when they could do that? No. What we did talk about is rather than piecemealing, their, this is their busy season, mm -hmm. so rather than piecemealing the work, we would, mm -hmm. we would like to have the group in a core and have it really coordinated and do it all at one time, <coughs> which means the install, assuming all works out, um, could be about October. That's probably what, if we want it all to happen in one time rather than piecemeal work. And this is all assuming that all groups are coming together with a solution that is outside of insurance or legal action. So are you going, are the residents going to have to stay out until October? We. Speaking with them on that, it seems as though we should be able to just have them exit the unit for the day and do the work at that time. For some of the units that have the flooring and the bedrooms as well, it might be a two-day process, but it would not be overnight. It would be livable overnight. Okay, so and that's the idea. Who moves their furniture? That's all to be worked out with the proposal as well. Um, and, and right now you have a workaround to keep the flooring safe? Yeah, we've weeks. got tape to manage potential trip hazards. We haven't had any, we don't have anything sticking up. It's all managed. Um, and we haven't, we, we can still pass inspection, which is the most important, um, but we certainly want to get this taken care of before that becomes a risk. Okay. Thanks for the update. Proposition 1B from the update.
Okay, so uh, this is something that kind of applies to a city council as well, but because it is so housing focused and it would impact LHA, we wanted to um, bring this to your attention tonight. So the um, Prop 1B funds that the voters passed in November um, are is the replacement of the sales tax that was going towards the jail renovation that will expire, and um, the voters agreed to the voters voted to continue that, but for the purpose of affordable housing. So it is anticipated that revenues would start being generated in 2025, and then a distribution to communities in, in a shape or fashion after that. What we've been working on with Boulder County and as the Regional Housing Partnership on the city side is coming up with a recommendation for the Board of Commissioners um, for a funding distribution model. Um, a, a myriad of options have been talked about. Um, one was fully competitive, which might look similar to a worthy cause process, just because that is all competitive and there is a pretty lengthy application process. And then um, what, what Longmont was advocating for is something that was closer to the disaster recovery funds where we used uh, data-based information to make sure that everybody got something that was relative to their needs, but also the communities came together and decided to do some set-asides for the specific communities or, or needs that were extreme. So we set aside some funds for Lyons and Jamestown because their impacts were so high um, and their capacity was so low, things like that, ways to come together to help all of, you know, all of the boats rise. Um, what the Regional Housing Partnership has ended up putting together, and this is all at a staff level, um, is what you see in your packet here. Right now, staff are going to the city's and town's leadership to get their input, and then eventually the Board of Commissioners would hold a public uh, work session and then make a decision after that. And so what staff has been working on is making sure leadership of the cities and towns are aware of the proposal um, and getting feedback on that in preparation for the board. So what is proposed here is um, kind of a multi-tiered model. Primarily it's population based as a baseline, but before you get to there, we did work on a couple of set-asides that staff agreed were, was, was fair and equitable. Um, to ensure that everybody got a minimum amount. So um, Lyons and Netherlands specifically who would like to utilize any funding they got in-house, meaning have staff to do it, um, they we would allow them a minimum of $100,000 a year with this, which could support a staff person, which could really amplify the work. Um, but the really small towns, Jamestown and Ward, their, their allocations would be to Boulder County to help manage in that area generally. Um, and then we also talked about having a um, opportunistic fund. So for the small community, small and medium community, so everyone except for Boulder County, Longmont, and Boulder, um, to be able to access a funding pot that is ready and waiting if an opportunity arises, but their annual allocation doesn't serve. And so if the safety net, however, is if they don't spend that in a reasonable amount of time, how much time is yet to be sorted or more, more high level at this point, then Boulder and Longmont, who have established mechanisms to be able to spend this type of money on affordable housing, could swoop in and make sure it's still being um, sent out the door and serving the community in a timely fashion. So Molly, when I look at the population, what is using what, uh, yeah. you, know, what you said about the LOA, said it was 106,000? Yeah. yeah. So this and is, so we had to use census data because that is the only source that all communities have access to and it would be the same for the same methodology for population calculation across the board and only within Boulder County because those are the only uh, taxpayers that are paying in. Mm -hmm. So Erie is actually quite small because most of their population is in wealth so we're using only their Boulder County population. Oh, okay. 
Okay. So we're are you going to update the numbers? Sir? Are you going to update the 2023 census numbers? Sure. Um, I th we, the plan will be to, uh, under this proposal, update them each year yeah. so that each year they change if populations, if people are moving around, it's still reflected. Mm -hmm. So part of the problem is not, I mean, so you have to use the census estimates, mm -hmm. but our number will always be lower than our total population because we will not count the population in Long Rockets in the county. Oh, okay. Okay. The same as here. Yeah, the same as here. So that's the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the other major set aside is, which this was built into the ballot language, that 85% of the funds would go towards unit generation efforts and 15% would go towards housing related services. So the proposal here is to um, kind of do the same thing where, Bull but in this case, Boulder County provides all the human services for all the small and medium cities and towns. So we would take Boulder, Boulder County, and Longmont and do a population split because each of those three has human service agency funding processes already that we could use things that we already have to get the money out the door and get it serving the community as fast as we could. Molly, does the whole 12 percent go to affordable or are you going to split that between affordable and attainable? It is allowed to be used for attainable. We have not drilled down that far yet because that would be, if this proposal goes forward, that would be Longmont's decision to make how they, how they should work okay. those. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As long as we're meeting the ballot language mm -hmm. for eligible activities, we could do that. So there's no action required. This is just a report, is that correct? Cor correct. Um, I've had some conversations with the city manager group, um, and it appears that everybody's in, in alignment. Uh, I know that I mentioned to Molly there was some questions about the small communities, mm -hmm. mines in Netherland. Mm -hmm. I think they said on this side they're, they're good with it. Not sure that that's what's being said consistently. Um, but the other interesting piece is, um, if you remember in the housing community, yeah. Lyons, Ned, and what was the other town? Jamestown? Ward? Um, Ward, was Netherland. No, it was Lyons, Netherland, and then a, some a town in Larimer County. They're looking at a mountain housing authority. Oh, oh. Is it Allen's Park? Allen's Park, I think. They're looking at a, a mountain housing authority, so that may be different in how they approach okay. so it's hard to say what's what's all in the mix in the, the city manager discussion you know the other component of this is how much housing can they really build in their communities just because of the geographic just mm -hmm. the terrain and everything else they have to deal with so um, I would say um, on this piece uh, in particular is if you all could look at it if you have any questions let us know okay. if you all support this concept let us know so then uh, we can communicate that to our counterparts and then when they have the public meeting we definitely will um, if this is the direction you all want to go with we'll our council to to be in, in attendance at that public meeting and or talk to the county commissioners about this approach because it's not clear what is on their mind in terms of how they look at the housing funds so um, Look at this, and then we'll talk to people. Go ahead. So I see that they have um, the opportunity, the homelessness in the regional. Uh, is, is there? Are we integrating some supportive steps? Or I know we talked about the whole regional homelessness uh, support and how we all can work together. Um, since we're already kind of doing this, and Boulder County would be the, the go-to for the smaller towns as far as wraparound services. So is there any way we can kind of tie in some of that for that regional homeless piece instead of having two regional different, I know this is a fun, opportunity fund and all of that, but I just feel like I don't want us to be duplicating the same thing and having different meetings for the same thing. And um, am I making myself clear? Kind of. Uh, I, I think I understand. What I 
what I think I hear you say is that each uh, jurisdiction, each city has a different type of population and homelessness and they have, because of the way their jurisdictions are, the way their municipalities are set up, maybe the same formula doesn't work for every city. Exactly. Is there a way, uh, do we have to follow the county model in order to get the funding we need for our cities? I think if, if this is the approach utilized and we get the money in for supportive services funding, well, that would do locally as long as what we're already funding in terms of the clinicians for network. Um, it's kind of a different piece because in the same conversation, we have other conversations working in terms of alignment on the data and having access to the same data set because that's really the biggest problem right now is we don't know where there's a duplication of services because the data hasn't been open to everyone. Um, we're getting close to that. Once that data is open to everyone, then, you know, that was a conversation of our ECC and what we're trying to do, because if we can get everybody to utilize it, then we'll start seeing where there's a duplication. What we've talked about is, to Molly's point, Boulder and Longmont, in terms of supportive services generally, are in, in the county, we're further down the road, and our smaller neighboring communities don't have the capacity uh, to build that within their existing structure. So I think the theory is is that the county would really support Lafayette, Louisville, Superior, and those communities. Boulder and Longmont would do what we're doing, but we integrate on the, on the data side and make sure that we're working collectively and not at cross purposes. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's, it's also what I mentioned in that discussion, it's a little bit different because when you look at our model um, and you look at how we're working within the center of excellence, we pretty much have most of our divisions engaged in it and so we don't necessarily have the single group that's doing the work and, and there's some nuances and differences in that and I guess the example I would give you is we're probably more coordinated with our public safety department than the county social services are with their public safety department and how we're approaching it. I don't know if that's answering your question or not. It was a good answer though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you're reserving 5% and you, you have a population of 2,000 that might be not very much money set aside but also um, maybe you don't have that many people. Mm -hmm. So I hate to put that money not to use. And maybe the best example is when the county created, I'm going to have to rely on Sarah a little bit for this, when they, when they created a co-responder program, they started talking to Longmont and Boulder because, hey, we've had ours going for much longer than anyone. And there were just some philosophical challenges that we were having in that um, with our co-responders we do dispatch a police officer because we feel like it's we're putting them into some really tough situations that you never know when it's been out of control. I think the county's approach was not to send their core responders with the police officer. And and so it part of it is we may be here and they may be here or they may be here, and, we, and it just, it's hard to align those pieces. But I think working coordination in terms of we don't go here, they go here, to make sure we're in the right boundaries is the work that will come out of this. Yeah, I just don't, just, I know that was just a preliminary conversation about the whole regional homelessness. I just feel like I, I want to be. I want us to be clear. I know we need the data. I know you stress that a lot, and that is true. We need to cross-reference what's going on over there, what's what's going on here. That person you served over there, and now they're over here. Uh, two days later, now we're serving them. Um, I just want to make. I think this is this is really good, but I, I think that we need to somehow. And I could be wrong, and thinking crazy. Um, but if we can make sure that those who the county support will continue to support 
you know, with that regional program. And then our support, our services will be amplified with the funding that we do regionally, but contingent upon the data that we that we receive and maybe it's with our new dashboard and mm -hmm. um, all of that, you know what I'm saying? So I think there's some kind of way we can integrate all of that together regionally to make sure we stay, uh, um, you know, our services stay excellent the way they are and, and, and advance them however we can. Um, because I think when we come together regionally, I'm not opposed to it as I said, but I don't want it to pull us down and start using our resources and then we start creating disparities within our own community with the sources, resources we already have. And so how can we look at this model of what the county will do um, and what, what they will do and what they will provide in this situation with wraparound services and when we're talking regionally, well, hey, you already doing that for those so let's concentrate on what is not being done for everyone else, right? So I have some information for you on that. Okay. So monthly there is a literally a regional meeting that's led by Boulder County, HSBC, mm -hmm. and several staff sit on that for long month. Um, I'm not on that meeting every month, but my work partner is. Mm -hmm. And so we are at the region talking um, about coordinated entry and what that looks okay. like for everyone. And we're, we're um, there's several, a long list of folks that sit in this meeting. So we are we are having those conversations. Okay. Yeah. When you're getting at what, I mean, I wish I could fully answer your question. We don't know, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's part of it. But you're getting at the component when we look at the voucher conversation I've been having with you all, and that I brought up in that meeting where if 50% of the county's vouchers are here, what are the supportive services that they're providing to their voucher holders, which I would argue in its current environment, not a lot, which means what's happening is as an organization mm -hmm. and as a community, we're picking that up. Mm -hmm. And I think that, to your point, we need to get clarity on that mm -hmm. because it's an additional strain that we're bearing as a community because they're placing their voucher holders here. Mm -hmm. And then it's not only creating a strain on our social service support, it creates challenges in terms of our vouchers because they pay at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we need that data to, to really start untangling all of this. That's why I keep saying that we've got to get that information right. quick. Yeah. So you could have more of a county rather than you know, each town? It seems like are moving <coughs> to town, or, um, should just the county handle that in the supportive services? Well, I mean, that's that hard because within the county you have three housing authorities, okay. and, and they each have their distinct boundaries. And so what's happened, what I mean, what I'm mentioning on the voucher side is related to this old, old agreement mm -hmm. that created the situation. So you have three different housing authorities, you have multiple municipalities. Each one of those municipalities are providing a different level of service within their community. So it's kind of hard to untangle that. And I think the big piece in this is that we've talked about as managers is each one of our communities, we really have our own, own we, you know, it's our own community and we have our own distinct issues that are not consistent from community to community. Sarah and I have talked about this. The unhoused issue in Longmont is distinctly different than the unhoused issue in Boulder. And what we're seeing in some of our ancillary communities are different than the two of us, maybe more similar to us, but yet still different. And so we're all having to use really specific strategies locally because our challenges are different. So to your point, Harold, that um, we have we are using 50% of Boulder's uh, vouchers. The funding it looks like it's based upon population, but shouldn't it be on the population served rather than on the population of the city? I think getting everyone to agree to that's going to be next to impossible. I know because a lot of the funding does go to Boulder because of their population. 
which has been part of the frustration. Well, but it's but hard. Then, it's hard because if you look at what population are you looking at? Um, what I referenced was the voucher holders. So 50% okay. of the voucher holders. Boulder has a higher population of unhoused. Okay. And and so depending what data set you're you're referencing, and I think that's why it's cleaner to probably just use the population in this model because if I were sitting in Boulder, I think I could make a pretty yeah. straightforward argument of what their challenges are and how they're different. Mm -hmm. um, similar to the argument that I'm making here locally, and I think that's why they felt population was the easiest approach. It's most neutral, certainly, but also um, there's this give and take, too, of for Longmont specifically, and this is something we've been open with the, the regional housing partnership communities about, that yes, we are we are shouldering a lot of the burden in terms of the affordable housing when we use the voucher, the seg that segment of it. But also, from the regional partnership side, we need Erie and Lafayette and Superior and Louisville. We need you to build so that yep. they don't have to come here. So there was, that's kind of our our balancing test that we've been using. I mean, in, in my meeting, just to kind of twist a little bit, I said, actually, if you're looking at it, you should figure out what's the percentage of sales tax that's going into that pot, mm -hmm. and then we, allocate it based on how much yeah. each city's paying into the sales tax yeah. model. Yeah. So we did look at that as an option as well. I was, I was thinking that that would be, yeah. uh, they'd be like probably a lot lot less likely to uh, to, to go go with something like that if that was that was that was proposed. They they have turned down quite a few developments even the most basic, even the ones that had purchasable units in the, in the last, I, I see this because I have my students present every semester and I find out that they're like going, turning it down, turning it down, turning it down. They're like over and over again, uh, developments, uh, because they're not quite right. One particular one is um, Red Tail Ridge. Uh, uh, there, and, uh, right across the street from my school, and it has commercial and a mixed-use development in there. That it's it had like three renditions of the development it had so far in the last. So the the opportunistic fund was it was kind of that opportunity. It's dull, but it's the opportunity. If you smaller, medium community. You have something. You're going to go for it and do it. Here you have access to do that. You can't make it work. <coughs> We've got the two communities that can make it happen as that safety net. That was one of the attempts to give them the shot, but also make sure it gets, gets out there. Carol, you had mentioned to me that you were following the Supreme Court on their ruling on homelessness. And have they made a decision on that yet? They have not made a decision, and that was what I was going to say. So what none of us know is what's potentially going to happen with the Supreme Court decision. Mm -hmm. And and it was a case out of Oregon, and it really was about, um, so you go to the Boise case, and generally the Boise case at 30,000 feet said that prohibiting camping and sleeping in public places violated the U.S. Constitution in terms of cruel, its cruel and unusual punishment. That's what they were arguing. The punishing the status. So it's, it's saying, right. you know, like, your status is an unhoused individual and makes you grow. So it, that, was the, uh, that was the kind of underpinning. Okay. But generally the city has always uh, kept a pretty solid eye on the Boise decision mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and uh, advised as if it might apply to us, mm -hmm. um, even though there hasn't been any binding decision that said it would. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll see like Denver and most of the big communities operate as if it does, because yeah. someone's going to see us and it might apply to us. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. And depending on what article you read, that is mm -hmm. right. um, That's a right. lot of articles think that it's high, it's likely that the Supreme Court will side with the cities on this issue. Um, and there were interesting arguments, and the, and the analogies they were drawing were really interesting to read through. 
Um, but it wouldn't surprise me to see that the Supreme Court comes in and says, no, it's a little, I mean, essentially some are making more local control arguments. Others are making arguments that say, well, taking that, if you don't have a restroom, is it not illegal to defecate in public? Making it akin to sit and lie. So, you know, probably for the next, what, two to three months? Yeah, end of the, end of the summer, I think, is the end of summer. summer. So you'll see something, but it's not, I don't think it's coming in. And, and I think for you all, I mean, we've talked about this. I think that's then where on the policy side, that's really going to probably fall in terms of what the community starts asking for based on that decision. And it's not going to be easy because you're going to have people all over the place in this area. But, yeah. Okay. We're, we're, we'll be waiting to see. How many vouchers do we get for the bus people? Well, we have, we have that coming up. Yeah. Uh, so now we're doing the review and acceptance of the LHA audit. Yeah, so um, we went the management decision and analysis for you guys. It's usually the first 14 pages of the audit. It goes through what our program and services are, who we serve, what um, what properties and kind of gives a little detail about those and then it goes into the financial analysis and shows you why our assets increased, why our liabilities increased, whatever increases or decreases that we have throughout the portfolio. Right now, um, we had about a $700,000 increase in our grant funding through HUD. That was due to part of an increase um, and also vouchering up and using our reserves. This was the first year that we actually used about 150,000 of our reserves that we had never actually tapped into before. Um, so that gave us a good increase this year. Um, cash has increased at about um, almost $1 million. The two contributors there are the sale of $615 million. Um, that brought in a, almost 500000 and then we also had both the 2022 and 2023 funding in 2023 that came for the LRA program, which is the other local rental assistance program that we have through the city that we manage. Um, so that kind of increased our cash. Our current ratio right now stands at 6.73. You want to be anywhere from 1.2 to 2 to be in a good liquidity stage, and we're at 6.73. So we're actually um, in a good good standpoint there. Our net position increased about 6.4 million. And a lot of that is due to just revenue and expenses that come in throughout the year. The biggest piece of that was the, the uh, assignment of Village Place Associates carry forward note that ends up on LHA's books. Um, so it got transferred as an assignment, which increased. That was 5.9 million which increased the net position um, of the Long Island Housing Authority. We did unfortunately get one funding this year. Last year we had four. We did get another one. I knew it immediately as I started planning the audit. We had, I had missed some reporting on some ARPA funding. And so I knew right away it was going to be a funding. <laughs> if, and they picked ARPA. They aren't. They picked our as part as our testing because it's a high risk. Mm -hmm. It's still high risk. Mm -hmm. So they picked that along with our HUD program um, mm -hmm. and tested it. Um, I had already submitted all the reports, but because they were submitted in 2024 yeah. um, and not in 2023, we got a better for that. So. This ARPA dollar, this ARPA stuff, where do you set So hopefully next year. No, we're not getting any ARPA this year, right? <laughs> no, we just signed the last, at least on the affordable housing yeah. side, we just signed yeah. the last agreement today. Yeah. So. But I mean, still a good audit. I mean, I think that was yeah. Yeah. One, yeah. Of those, one of those issues that, you know, we were just talking about it just now is if we ever have to do this again, how do we do it in a way that just 
doesn't require this ongoing saga of, of recording it, even though you haven't quite spent it or you spent it, and it's just, you gotta work through that. But we may never have another ARPA program again, so who knows. And all of our ARPA, on the city side, all the other ARPA funds associated with affordable housing will be paid out, done in 2024, except for the one staff position that we have through 25. So were there the any coaches. advantages or benefits from the reporting and all of that with ARPA funding? Or would you say it was just all hell? <laughs> so, so, here, so the reporting kind of just needs to be looked at, like what makes sense. So what I was having to report on was the financial status. When the financial status was done, it's a, it's a one and done. So I'm submitting the exact same report quarterly, by the 10th, nothing changes. Until the very end of the project, where you close it out, and usually with CDBG, you provide beneficiary data, but ARPA doesn't require the beneficiary data. But the project is not construct it's when when we're got CO and we have people moving in. That's when the project intent has been served mm -hmm. that we fund it for construction. So it's like I give Aaron a million dollars to build this project and I'm done. He's building it every year, every month. She has to put a report saying no change, no change, no change, no change. Oh and then when you get and then when you get the CO, then you file the final report, mm -hmm. and and that's where it was like that's where I, was, I said, can we do a preliminary final so you don't have to say no change for X number of months? Well, I thought I had all my orphans, but those were continued from 2022. Yeah. So I'm still reporting on 2022 on uh -huh. dollars that we received. Christmas. Which will be done soon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ribbon cuttings coming so, up. So, yeah. So, so that's a problem. I mean, when you look at it, it's not a material finding because it's not right, right. Oh. that something's wrong. It's just they didn't submit the report, which the report that they were submitted couldn't say anything anyway. Other than no changes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think when, when we were building it in 2022, the idea was, okay, so if we have to do this for every other funding program, we're like we're used to it, this, it'll just be in the mix mm -hmm. through this, the regular quarterly cycle. But it's still a one-off funding program exactly. and it is a, still a different thing to track. So I think the intent was to streamline. Okay. So that was just the one finding or five? Because you said it was four last year and what this year? Just one. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. 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 That's We're nitpicking. <laughs> yeah. I want zero. Uh, that's why you only had one. You're working. Yeah. I'm working there. That's great. Good job. Yeah. I mean, where were we at when we transitioned? Yeah. Oh, Double digits. Yeah. Really? I remember. Yeah. It was. And we were we were budgeting in the negative. So, in the negative. Yeah. You know. Well, and they were, those were material findings. I mean, oh, I think that's another discussion. Oh, yeah. Before it was like lack of internal controls. Yes. Um, there were financial findings. Yeah. I mean, it was that. Those were material. Uh -huh. This is a program finding. It's not a financial finding. We've been clear of the financial findings for a few years now. Yeah, we haven't had any financial findings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, it's really great. Yeah. So we're at the uh, development updates from Harold. Oh, okay. no, oh, yeah, you do need to accept it. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Okay. to accept We do. Can I have a motion then to, uh, do I hear you say the motion? So I, yeah, I'll move to accept it. Yes. Oh, I wasn't. I heard you. I thought I heard you say that, so I made a motion to second. Yes, if we need to, yes. So what is your motion? So I move to accept the, um, OHA financial report. Audit. Second. Audit, yes. Okay. It's been moved by Commissioner Hidalgo Faring and seconded by Commissioner McCoy to accept the uh, LHA 2023 audit. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? And that passes. Six to zero. Six to zero. Six to zero. Six to zero. <laughs>
I had to even think. Oh, Diana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, she it, said I. It's not even that little. It keeps you counting. <laughs> it keeps you doing something. That's what she has. So, um, development. Our, I'm going to go first, um, since this is all following under my, my report. Um, I wanted to cover the voucher status update. Um, so in 2023, in 2022, we had $5.3 million in vouchers. Um, and then for 2023, we had $5.8 million. So that increased by 8.4%. Uh, for 2024, and if you remember, this is one of the goals we set to increase voucher funding. Uh, the number went from 5.8 in 2023 to 6.8 in 2024. So we have about a million dollar increase in our voucher funding. So that, that's a, a good thing in that we're getting more money. They were pretty stagnant for what? At least seven to 10 years. Or it was a big, big, and so, we are seeing the increases now. Now that's based on a few factors. Obviously it's dependent on Congress and budget appropriations, um, the pro program requirements, um, public housing agency, we submit data um, that goes into it. The thing that we were seeing that we thought was really the headwind into the housing authority and the vouchers was performance. Um, because if um, some of you may remember when we took it over is that they weren't fully vouchering up and they weren't utilizing the two-year tool. Um, and so now that's been pretty consistent. So we think the performance piece was a big change for us this year. Um, and then obviously policy changes. Um, here's the challenge of this. We got a million dollars um, and we're currently not releasing any vouchers because if you remember we allocated project-based vouchers to Village Place, and Christmas, Ascent, Ascent, and, and, Ascent, and, and then Atwood. And then Atwood. So we have to manage the project-based vouchers within the total dollar amount. Here's the big challenge. Um, the 2024 fair market increases have been significant in terms of what that means that we're paying for each individual voucher. So while we got an additional million dollars, the fair market rates increase. Um, and if you remember when the county, to my point earlier, when Boulder and Boulder County went to 110%, the last time we moved to 105 and we said we that's all we can move. We're actually sliding back to 100% to make sure we continue funding the vouchers that we have. And so the fair market rents are basically eating up this increase. And so if you remember when Congressman Lingus was here and I said I'd like to talk about this with your staff, now that we have this, and, and did I get that right, Ken? That's right. We are just confirming that BHP and BCHA also had to roll back to 100 this year. Oh, they rolled, back, yeah. they rolled back from 110? To, okay, so that's, we didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. So because the rents are increasing so dramatically, everybody's having to slide back to 100. The good news for us is we're now picking level with them if they move back to 100. But the rent increases are just eating up the money. So we may not, we're not gonna have a significant number of new vouchers, if any new vouchers, because the rent increases are basically taking all the money. Probably gonna lose vouchers. We could lose vouchers. Well, currently right now we are lowering our voucher counts so that we can add the PVDs in. Right. So in January we had 426 vouchers. And then by April we were at 416. So we had dropped to the 10 vouchers, but we're seeing almost a twenty thousand dollar increase in our budget. So our costs are increasing but our vouchers are going down. So and it's a double edged sword. You're gonna lose admin dollars because that's based on a per voucher assignment, mm -hmm. what you utilize. But but it's gained on the other side too. PBB income being at for village at least almost start coming in on the PBB side. It's kind of moving it over. Yeah, but it's a different no, time. Not until yeah, not until no. we can actually voucher up. But but that mm -hmm. kind of we might still be at the same voucher as we are today. So. I know this is another crazy 
um, I, I don't know if it's an idea or whatever, but can a city put a cap on um, rent increases? Oh, yeah. I said the other day and that I was told. Well, so there's, there's the rent restriction issues. The state statute on rent restriction uh, prohibits us from having rent restrictions like that. But there are other municipalities, maybe not in the state of Colorado, but other states that uh, cities can do that? Well, so maybe like New York had, had a pretty mm -hmm. famous um, policies on rent restriction. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in reaction to that, the state, state legislature in Colorado prohibited rent restriction. Is that part of that Telluride decision, or is that um, date? any? It feeds into it. It, it predated Telluride, but it uh -huh. added to it, yeah. Okay. Uh, certainly. So the Telluride decision uh -huh. was on requiring affordable yes. housing uh -huh. units on the rent percentage on, on the rental side. Yeah, uh -huh. well, it, exactly. And, and then the Telluride decision looked at that statute and applied uh -huh. that statute. Uh, as long as there was a voluntary agreement, that it was okay. okay. And that's why we had. Um, for those of you around the early stages of IH, uh, we went kind of out of our way to make it a voluntary agreement when you're going to put on-site units on mm -hmm. for, for rental as IH compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, but since the legislature has uh, amended that statute to allow IH type programs to, to mm -hmm. kind of be uh, exempted from that rent control statute. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, a lot of it has to do with ownership. Um, properties that the city owns, we can set the rent for everyone. Yeah, the city of LAJ owns it, we can set a rent, but we, LA, every LAJ property is subject to. But then your tax credits and yeah. your yeah. investors yeah. are indicating where the rents need to be set, so. Darn it. Yeah. It's a free market idea. Um, <laughs> what about incentives for lower rents? Terms of property tax. Yeah. Well, so uh, the city has uh, uh, Chapter 479, which is uh, incentives for providing affordable housing on site uh, for uh, various development uh, fees. But property uh, taxes like that. So, so, but you have to generally. <coughs> So we, we use 479 incentives on most of our developments as well to get the to get the permitting fees down because 100% of our units are, are affordable, which is fee restricted. Um, but some other developers do use the, that that incentive, um, like outside of IH and outside of other things, just to, to reduce their uh, permitting fees. But I don't think that that necessarily makes up for the gap between what they could make in the open market mm -hmm. and an affordable price. It still allows them to do market value yeah. if they use that. Well, 479 required, if you are getting a, sorry, and Molly might want to talk about this more, but it, 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 if you're getting a 479 uh, permanent fee reduction, you have to have deed restricted okay. uh, yeah. affordable units, which means permanently deed restricted units. We can ask for more, uh, uh, I mean, we can make a decision as a council to ask for more affordable housing if we felt that was necessary. Yeah, but for a lot of people, affordable housing is still not affordable. So no, no, I agree. I'm yeah, just saying I'm that, just that's the only tool I think we have in the yeah. tool. Yeah, I don't think you could affect your property taxes. I mean, mm -hmm. so here's this group couldn't do it. Now, the only place we can do that is when we go into a special limited partnership on project that meets the requirements under the LIHTC standards and what we have to go through. And so when we engage in that SLP, they pay us money to the housing authority, but then they're exempt from taxes. I think, you know, doing something for particular renters who have market rate to, to do it, I think the only way council could probably do that is to take money out of the general fund and create a program of which it would be a reimbursement, but I don't think you could create a different taxing piece on, on this side, on, on the taxing side of it. 
definitely couldn't do it on an individual basis. Right. Right. Yeah. Sounds too complicated. You would be taxed less if you had a, a, a permanent deed restriction, <coughs> affordable deed restriction. So we've had people in our old um, IH program, oh, yeah, the pre-2008 yeah. IH program, um, where their deed restrictions could have rolled off because they were 10-year deed restrictions, and they voluntarily like voluntarily elected to keep them on to, to get a lower taxable base on their property taxes. But I don't think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, Does the city of Longmont make decisions on property? No, but that um, 233 just passed in the legislature. I haven't made it all the way through the verbiage of it. It's going to step down the property tax for a yeah, but I can't the city of London doesn't make that decision. No, no, no. And, and we make decisions about the board's own our own rate living. Yeah, but so we can't change anything in regards to our our uh, uh, giving anybody incentives. No, but we can uh, we can choose to accept or not accept um, the county assessor's assessment. So on isn't that correct? You, you might want to talk to the person who's <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. a significant yeah. amount of time doing <laughs> just <laughs> that. But, uh, <laughs> Share your knowledge. So uh, the question is, well, about um, that we can we can whether yeah, as a home rule, do we have to accept a county assessor's value on property? You, I don't I don't believe that you can object on behalf of a property owner mm -hmm. yeah. and then all municipal properties are already tax exempt I mean so there there is statute for, and it has to go through the state you can't do it through the county assessor either but uh, nonprofit affordable housing providers can apply and be granted property tax exemption I mean Habitat for Humanity has tons of them so, so that's what our special limited partnership does. We take it, we take a partial ownership in whatever project, and mm -hmm. that project pays us to take that partial ownership, and then the the, the project itself then becomes uh, tax free. Uh, so that's the point of the special limited yeah. partnership. We mostly do that with kind of our own projects, mm -hmm. um, but there's a couple examples out there that are not really an LHA project that are using the LHA tax exemption through the special limited partnership vehicle. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a double-edged sword. So you flip the sword over, yeah. and the more you reduce that revenue, then what you start doing is constraining, not on the housing authority side, but on the city side, you start constraining the operational you know, capacity. Yeah, it goes back to the general, yeah. That goes back into the general fund, which is what Jim <coughs> was talking about mm -hmm. in that you know, it's highly likely that level one, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we could theoretically, you know, if certain votes pass, it could be level one expenses is all we can do mm -hmm. with the revenue model. And so, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever yeah. side you're looking at, yeah. there's going to be a cut somewhere in terms of how you're trying to deal with the situation. Mm -hmm. just, oh, I'm sorry, I was just thinking, I didn't try to go down this rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. I was just really <laughs> yeah. thinking about the vouchers. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, this is really good information, don't get me wrong, but I was just thinking about how the market rate is really affecting the vouchers mm -hmm. um, distribution and everything. So, sure. that's, that's, and like you said, it's a two-edged sword, right? Yeah. So. Well, and that's why I get very cautious about making these sweeping policy changes without, you know, thinking through what could be some of the unintended consequences. So if we're just very specific and cognizant on, okay, we're going to reserve this for LHA properties or for certain aspects rather than just as whole citywide because that can have greater negative impacts. I think if, if we look at it from the LHA side and you mm -hmm. go, what's, what's impacting the numbers in the rent? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you, know, you look at it just basic economics, the vacancy rates are still pretty low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Sarah, I don't know, do you know what the vacancy rates are like? Off the top of my head. But I, 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 no, across the board. Oh, across the board. Oh, across the board. Yeah. Oh, I'd say, <laughs> like, conventional, they're, they're at least... Like I just up at Notch at their ribbon cutting. Uh -huh. I think they're That's ninety five percent rent. Oh, okay. So I mean, we have they're very 
85% or less. Yeah. Yeah, so we know we're sub 5% vacancy rates. Mm -hmm. So when you're sub 5% vacancy rates of multifamily, mm -hmm. your rents are going to continue to rise. Mm -hmm. So the demand is more than the supply is fulfilling. And, and then that's why it's bleeding down into the voucher world. And then if we go back to our housing needs analysis that does apply with what we're looking at, we know that there's a lack of higher end apartments in the community. And so the housing studies have indicated that what's happening then is somebody like me mm -hmm. who could pay for a, a really high end apartment if you don't have that bought, if you don't have that available in your, availability in your community, mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're buying the next level down. Yeah. So then they're pricing the folks who can afford that and then it just starts snowballing and we've seen that through what two housing mm -hmm. assessments that that is continuing to occur mm -hmm. so it's a slight it's, it the market is what's eating mm -hmm. the voucher value because the rents are continuing to be able to be escalated because of the demand mm -hmm. which when you look at high interest rates on the home ownership side what you will typically see is as interest rates are increasing, more people are moving into the rental market versus mm -hmm. the other side. So, mm -hmm. it, I mean, we're dealing with national and international mm -hmm. economic oh, yeah. forces. Mm -hmm. well, is this 1B opportunity fund going to yield more vouchers or could it be used for vouchers? No. Um, it's just for building or preserving and associated services. Okay. So on the development updates, do we have any more after the voucher? I just can do a couple brief ones mm -hmm. if you're interested. Um, so Christmas, we have a grand opening June 6th, and so you're all invited. Um, I know that Mayor Peck, you're not Commissioner Peck, Commission Chair Peck. Sure. <laughs> yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. um, you're not able to attend, correct? Um, I might be able to. Okay. We with seven. Okay. So I think we will be reaching out to confirm if anybody would like to speak at the event. And if not, we can always do it as well. But we would like to offer you that opportunity first. Um, so that's exciting. I took a tour the other day because we were showing the Ascent investor some comps in the area. So it was, mm -hmm. I'm excited to get there. Um, Zinnia is moving almost ahead of schedule on construction. So we are starting lease ups in June. Ooh, we are starting yeah. the process to get people geared up and ready. That's great. So we just got our tenant selection plan finalized, um, which says exactly how the tent that people come in through the shelter and through Boulder Shelter being the, the uh, referral agency um, and getting that all sorted. And related to tenant selection plan, the, if you recall, on the suites where we had um, DOH agree to modify it to 100% local case conferencing rather than the statewide list, MHP is run down the wait list and we are through it and they're about to transition over to local case conferencing, so that's also good news. So that means local people in coordinated entry mm -hmm. now will go into the suites versus those individuals getting caught in the state system. That's great. So when we talk about working with the unhoused that we were talking about earlier, that gives us a direct connection. So Zinnia, because that is structurally funded and purpose built for permanent supportive housing, does have a mix of statewide list and uh, local coordinated entry. So we would be doing, we'll be leasing up and I think everyone could start occupying, they plan to get their CO in September. Um, Ascent, we are cruising along to closing, so we're in that very heightened period of the last <coughs> couple months right before closing. So next month at this meeting, you'll see all of our closing resolutions for Ascent, but we're getting all the funding in order and a million legal documents in order. Mm -hmm. So, And they're uh, cruising along, getting ready for burn building permit as well, which is anticipated that same time in July. Don't be surprised if we have legal documents that are coming at the last minute and we have to have special meetings because it just seems like every close that we've gone through that's happened. Mm -hmm. We are trying to plan, we learned a lot of lessons and we're trying to plan ahead at least for the, the formal actions needed, but yes, I would not it put it past the, us to have some. It happened on the hotel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, Village on Main, we are halfway through construction as of this month. 
um, we are certainly in the thick of it. And so these residents are, they are being so wonderful. Um, they are very, they're very involved. So we do have a lot of conversations going with a lot of different people, but overall for um, the, it's heavy construction there right now. Heavy construction in the lobby and the common spaces and um, it, they're, they're being real troopers. And so we just had a big, we're doing construction meetings with all the residents once a month. We just had it yesterday. And considering what the, the noise and the fire alarms and the plumbing, you know, they had a bike purse, burst pipe and things that um, they're being very patient and being troopers. So. Well, and now they're getting caught up in the Kaufman Street project. So then yeah. we'll turn the water off the way to the Kaufman <coughs> Street project. So right about the time we finish this, Coffin Street project is going to start coming. Yeah. So it's it's going to be disrupted. There's going to be a lot of disruption. Luckily, the parking lot work at for Village is sandwiched between the Excel gas lines on Coffin and the actual work on Coffin. So at least the, the parking lot is going to be open during all the Coffin active work. We'll see how that all goes. But that's the, that's the plan because the parking lot work is supposed to start in early July. So um, when I was telling you, railroad's easy. Yeah. <laughs> All the other stuff. It is. Oh, it is not, doing um, self-performing construction mm -hmm. and occupied construction as well is a major lift. It is mm -hmm. doing like for Katie, our project manager, doing a scent, a brand new project from start to finish is a giant project for her. But this is another level of coordination and detail and and um, communication with so many parties. So she's getting a good a good dose of good experience. So um, and otherwise, then what we'll be starting to pick up here soon because we've got we have this rolling pattern going on, and so we're going to pick up those project projections that we presented to you all. I think in early 2023. Um, and then you saw a bit of it with the budget because we, we do have a development fee budget that we went over in the fall. Um, we're picking that up as well to say, okay, so once we get through Village and Ascent, then how do we pace out the next, the next plans? So we'll bring that back. Um, we are meeting uh, as staff with um, some financial advisors and uh, a debt company um, to potentially look at another project that we've talked about um, and so it's possible we may need an executive session in June um, to talk to you all about it. But that one, that project is going to be, um, it's going to have affordable units but it's also then going to have um, workforce attainable units and be restricted, income restricted. So um, once we get a sense of talking to the financial advisors. Uh, we may, we're, we're going to need potentially an executive session. Any questions about development? No. Okay. Date on operations. All right, I'm going to, our operations team is, is absent tonight, so I'm going to jump in. Um, the very second to last page in your packet has our occupancy report. Overall, we're at 95% um, occupied. Uh, it's 93 once you consider Village on Main with the, the units that we've held, but those are getting leased up as, as we have um, them renovated and temporary moves not needing them anymore. Um, our, I mean, I'll just let you ask any questions about the vacancy report, including um, meth units, if you have any questions. How's that new company that you're doing for now? Uh, remediating Sarah, that. Yeah. So they have, they just um, completed one of the suites and their pricing came in, you know, lower than our demos. So that's obviously a very good thing. Um, so we're, we're still, and actually we use them to clean another bathroom here in town. Um, so we're liking what we're seeing. Good. Mm -hmm. So um, they, had, they had some bumps in the road. Um, regarding staffing, so that was where we had just met with them a few weeks ago to make sure that they're still operating and they do have an office here in one home. So, great. Um, and then I'll move to property updates if there are not other questions on vacancy. 
Um, just a couple of highlights. Uh, the Center for People with Disabilities has been going around to pop in conversations at all the properties, um, doing outreach for their services. And so that is part of the services that we ask them to provide in exchange for the, the deal that we did on the building, selling the building to them. And so that is kicked off. I got to listen to that yesterday. And um, the woman that they have <coughs> going around and doing it, she's wonderful. She's really great. And I'm excited. The residents were excited. And um, I'm excited to see how that comes together. I don't remember if uh, Commissioner McCoy and Chris were here. The building, uh, the value was around six hundred fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, they could only afford a half a million, so the board agreed to sell that for a half a million in exchange for what is it? Five, five years. Five years. They're going to be providing services to the residents in the Longmont Housing Authority properties, mm -hmm. similar to what we did that we talked to you all about in your capacity as LHA and City Council with the Recovery Cafe to mm -hmm. where they have the CDBG funding, but then they're providing recovery services, primarily at the suites right now. I mean, that's mm -hmm. its own thing, but working with them. So we also work on partnerships in, in that way to help other local organizations, but then get the services that we need at our facilities. Um, in our efforts that were related to the first couple items on tonight's agenda, we're still working on the big ticket um, accessibility improvement items while we have the special funding sources available. So we just finished um, brand new handrails at the Briarwood here about a week ago. And so that was a big ticket item that we're really glad we're knocking these things off and we've got a couple other slated for the summer and early fall, really trying to kill multiple birds Hate that phrase. Get very, be very um, productive on multiple ends of things, um, using the special one-time funds and getting all this stuff done. Um, we've got some staff changes coming up. So we have a new maintenance tech. His name is Z. He started at Spring Creek and Fall River on Friday. Um, he comes with a ton of experience, so we're happy to get that staffed up. Um, the our community manager Gregory. He resigned and left and traveling the world right now. Mm -hmm. um, the assistant community manager, John, who the residents love, accepted that position of community manager, so the residents were very happy about that. Um, and so they, his position, the assistant, is currently posted. Mm -hmm. And then we're hiring also an assistant manager for the suites and what will be Zinnia. So we're trying mm -hmm. to get that position onboarded ahead of doing the lease up, because that'll be a big lift. Um, oh, and we have, well, I think that's it, just two assistant community manager positions. Um, I have a question mm -hmm. on the, um, so the second round of surveys for, um, just um, what, what has been the feedback um, looking at trauma-informed design, like how are those surveys playing out and how are the residents responding? I don't think we have, uh, what I should ask. Jonna, our on-site community manager, is if she's gotten any feedback from the residents or how well their participation levels were. Okay. But I don't think we have the results from MSU yet. They're waiting okay. to put those together in a conglomerated fashion. But that's a good question. I'll follow up with Jonna. Thanks. Any other overall operations questions? Okay. I don't see any hands up. I think we just have Sarah. Unless you guys want to know about the financials. <laughs> <laughs> so first quarter financials mm -hmm. are in the packet. Mm -hmm. um, but there are no concerns except for um, AMN and Briarwood, which currently have four vacant units um, and several are down for that at both of those places. We've already reached the annual budget in the first quarter. Um, on vacancies for those two properties. Mm -hmm. So we're going to want to monitor those um, as, as they, they go through the year okay. on those. Um, and then there's there's no real heavy hitters with AR. There was about a, a thousand dollar increase from December to April now um, as far as the current balances. Um, we do have some past balances that are working through the collection process. but. Um, no red flags mm -hmm. there either. Do you have any evictions? Mm -hmm. 
Mm, I'll let Sarah take that and then. Can you help us? Thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I passed the baton. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yes, we will have one uh, coming up at the suites mm -hmm. at the end of the month, uh, late next week. And that's the only one. We, we do have another one that's an interesting one. And um, it's primarily related to the fact that they don't meet the qualifications anymore because of income. And, and that ties to the vouchers and other things. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a good story <coughs> in that the income has definitely improved, but when you have all of these other requirements under your voucher standards and these other pieces, then they can no longer be in a, a unit with the project base. So we're working through those issues right now. There are grace periods built yeah. in, but those have passed. Um, and ideally, it's a you, know, you graduate, and we've we've reached out and tried to um, provide. We've reached out to other communities because we have 70, 80 percent units now at Christman, but they leased up, they leased oh, up, really? which is actually really good news for Christman. Um, so we were really trying to help help the household graduate out, um, but it's a tough, it's a big change. Does that happen often? Were they? It's the first time. They first time this is the first time we've seen it. Uh -huh. Seems like it should be a celebration. In a way, unless they're it on is. the street. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, I know. It's hard, right? It grows awesome. me. Yeah. And it's it's the classic example of that threshold. Yeah. I mean, we see. I mean, we see it in different programs, but you know, this one because of all the federal requirements. I mean, exactly. Um. So we did the occupancy and property updates, mm -hmm. so yeah. public health and safety. All right, um, working on some staff training in, regarding meth and fentanyl and what to be aware of when they're in the units. Um, also, this came up recently too, we had some, you know, whether, you know, a person that gets transferred to the hospital or they pass, what do we do with animals? So really working with procedure with staff on, on that piece. Um, I'm on. I'm in the hunt for a new background company. Um, we're not really happy with what we're seeing with the one that, um, basically, the one that we were using got bought out by a company in California, and we're not we're not getting what we need. And this is actually very. Um, e everyone right now is having issues with the backgrounds. So the one that I work with. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, our meth detectors. I met with our vendor today, talked to him about some things we're seeing and, and um, looking at getting some quotes on some detectors for Village on Main. And so we're able to give our LHA staff an update on that soon. Um, what was interesting is that they, this, they uh, work with a gentleman that owns a company on Broomfield and there's a product that's called Crystal Clear and if you, like when the detector goes off right away, and if you can get in there, it's like a spray. And you don't have to wear a lot of PPE. You can wipe it down and it gets the level below, five or below. So I'm going to meet with this gentleman um, soon to find out. I guess he's been in business for quite some time. So um, ironically, he's in Broomfield. New Zealand had to introduce me to him. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> what else? Cameras. The city is, I believe, in the next week going to sign a contract. So, I'm working with pur uh, purchasing as we speak. We're going to have to change a few things that we have in our scope of work, but um, we're ready. I mean, I can't wait because I keep talking about this. It's like a broken record. But yeah. Yeah. Be good. You, you want to talk about our our hell? <laughs> the cameras were a prime example of that. in terms of what we had to do. And you go down this, and it's like, oh, it doesn't need this. And you have to, it was it was wearing everyone out. Mm -hmm. so. so and then calls for service have been uh, relatively very low, yeah. very low, even at the suites. Mm -hmm. So good. we're all. We're all doing well. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what's wrong? 
what's going on. <laughs> to calm me out. Yeah, cool. I don't yeah. trust Summer is coming. Uh, I don't trust her. Uh, and I can't say reviewing the security reports, this company, mm -hmm. um, we're, we're catching things that need to be caught. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wouldn't be able to do that without these folks that are mm -hmm. going to the properties and seeing the things that just aren't being reported by residents or, mm -hmm. you know, people trespassing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's. Working very well. Right now, they're randomly going to the properties. Once we get the cameras in, they're just going to be monitoring the cameras. Okay. Versus, and they may mm -hmm. still do some random, but. Gotta love technology. But it works, it works. Mm -hmm. wow. It doesn't. It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Like when questions? we lost internet during CMS. Yeah. Do we have any testing. questions for um, Sarah on health and safety? Very thorough. Thank you. Yeah. Just good, good reports on everything. A lot of work. Harold mm -hmm. looks tired, but Molly, for some reason, you're looking a, a little better. Uh. Hey. Hey. Yeah. Well, right. we, the hired extra capacity. Yes. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Uh, do we have any uh, comments from commissioners? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm going to be adjourned. Second. Second. Then by. Commissioner Corsi, Mike Commissioner, Donald Perry, and the Attorney General's Committee. Hi. All those of you here like halfway out the door, man.